Hello, I'm Tom Sullivan, and this is I'm my... Patty Sullivan. Well, yeah, you are. <laughs> Patty, my beautiful Patty, is here today very specifically to talk to you about someone who changed our lives. Betty White, you know, we all know was a comedy icon, and for over 75 years, she brought into our homes and into our hearts unforgettable characters, and they were all carried out with her exquisite comedy timing. I mean, you, you all know about her beautiful smile or those dimples, huh? Or the fact that when she looked at the camera, you always get the feeling that there was something else going on behind her eyes. And there usually was a devilish thought that just tried to get out, right? Yeah. But that's the public Betty White. My wife, Patty, and I have known Betty for over 55 years. And she was the reason that we got married. Yeah. And she was the reason that you've written what I consider to be one of the most beautiful pieces of work I've ever read. I, it's so interesting to be married to someone for 55 years and then have them write a book. I've written 15 books, and I could not have written this beautiful work. So let's start there. What made you think that you, I mean, why did you want to write this book? You know, you will know this, Tom. Um, the book started as my own personal reflections my own personal journal. And I wanted to record just for myself, moments that I shared with Betty, moments that our family shared with Betty that were so beautiful. I didn't want to forget the look on her face, the sparkle mm -hmm. in her eyes when we had moments together. And so I started just as the journal uh, for myself. It evolved into more reflective thinking, I would say. And my book is somewhat spiritual in a way. Uh, of reflecting the the um, the moments I had with Betty that that meant you know far beyond me. There's some chapters that talk about her end of life um, that I think are universal thoughts. But all of this started to come together, and Betty had asked us, or we had actually asked her, Bets, what would you like us to do um, you, at the end of your life? Would you like to? to have a party? Is there someone <laughs> that you would you would like to have speak on your behalf? What would you like us to do? And in her flippant, wonderful way, she would just say, you kids do what you want. I will be gone. I will know the secret at the end of life. So do what you want. And as I think about that now, um, actually paying tribute to her, honoring her, and keeping her legacy alive is what I want to do. And I know it's what Tom and our family want to do. And so it, and, and that's the reason we're we're between covers today. And you had a unique thought process when you were doing this. Uh, folks, think about the title, Betty White's Pearls mm -hmm. of Wisdom, you know, Life Lessons from a Beloved American Treasure. If you think about pearls of wisdom, pearls become really important to you in this work. Talk about that. Actually, um, the working title of my book was Mother of Pearl. And I, I love that stone. It's, it's a natural piece of nature that is so reflective and beautiful in and of itself. And I began to think of Betty that way. And so I looked at the definition of Mother of Pearl, which is uh, about the introduction in the book. And each title of each chapter is uh, one of those um, essences of the Mother of Pearl. So iridescence, translucence. Um, survival. Every every chapter is a pearl. And in that chapter, I talk about um, the essence of Betty being strength, the essence of Betty being uh, luminescent and, and, and luminous. Um, and so that's how that all began. And, and then, of course, uh, as we came to actually publishing the book, um, Betty White's Mother of Pearls, what, uh, Betty White's Pearls of Wisdom, I'm sorry, is the, the title that I think speaks to uh, a greater audience. Th that's why, folks in the audience, that's why we're so excited about premier books. These premier books, 2,500 of them now, really are special in that they're autographed by Patty, and they really are the first 2,500 books that were printed. So when you think about having one, maybe we'd like to think that you have a pearl something that you'll treasure for a long, long time. It's also, by the way, a pretty good Christmas gift if you want to go get some now and send them out to pals and friends and family because Patty has shared so much. And I think to understand 
the essence of it or where it all began, we'd better talk about that. You and I met Betty and Alan. 1968, a while ago. (laughs) You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, Tom, you're more of that story. And of course, I talk about it in the string chapter, which is a a lot about Tom and how we met Betty and Alan Ludden at the time. And I just remember being so wowed by Betty. I I was uh, at the University of Arizona and taking a, a summer abroad to Cape Cod, (laughs) not abroad, (laughs) but to Cape Cod, which, oh my gosh, I I was such a Kennedy fan. I was nuts. And at the suggestion of a friend to go to Cape Cod for the summer, forget it. I was packed and ready to go. But that same summer, um, I met the gentleman to my left, my husband of 54 years. And that same summer, Tom and I met Betty and Alan. And of course, Tom was such an, is, was and is such an amazing talent they were blown away by Tom's performance. Um, Tom was performing in a, in a club that summer for the first time uh, while he was going to Harvard. And his singing voice, his uh, ability to woo an audience was incredible. And Betty and Alan were wooed. And Alan, who was a great supporter of new talent, just would not um, uh, refrain from his desire to help Tom's career launch, which he did back in those days. Well, there's more to the story too. And essentially, when I think back on it now, uh, I used to come to their table between sets and sit with them and 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 have a drink and, and talk about show business. And I began to share my hopes and dreams with them. Uh, and one night, Betty White started to say to me, why? Are you hanging out with all these ladies? Because they wanted his attention. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of ladies in yeah. the audience well, that three months of that summer. <laughs> but here was the great, thank goodness, Betty White was the person who stood up and said, Tom, there's one girl who comes into this club. And if you, blind man, if you could see her eyes, look at you. And it's always been that way. And it still do. You'd never (laughs) date anyone else. And Betty grabbed me and yanked me, pulled me across the room and said to Patty, excuse me, young lady, what's your name? And Patty said, I'm Patty Stephan. She said, this is Tom Sullivan. Sit down. And she pushed me into a chair. And so Betty White and Alan Ludden, in so many ways, are the reasons we're married, huh? Absolutely. And you know, know, without them... I wouldn't have won the man of my dreams here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the other thing about this was I had come from a broken home. My my father had left my mother. I'd been in boarding school all my life, a school for blind kids, before I went to college. And I really didn't understand what made love work. Uh, If you sat across the table from Alan Ludden and Betty White back in 1968, They'd been married for five years at that time. And you did say this to me. They were luminescent, right? You, you've talked about how they would come into a room and and they it's would It's as just... if they had a spotlight over them wherever they were. They were both so alight with their love for each other. Alan had lost his first wife to cancer and Betty hadn't found the man of her dreams yet. And as a couple in their 40s and 50s, they were so aglow and each one of them had their own light. And whenever they walked into a room, you couldn't help but look across and say, who, wow, who is that? And in that little club in 1968, even a blind guy could feel the love. It really, I think a big part of why we got off to such a wonderful start in our marriage was because I thought, oh, is this the way it's supposed to be? Mm -hmm. That's how we're supposed to do this. And then Alan went on to do so much for me. We came to California because of them. He helped me get my first record contract. He introduced me to Mike Douglas uh, in Philadelphia and then Dinah Shore and Johnny Carson. Uh, We owe them, in that sense, so much much of our lives. And and then (laughs) they went on to do so many other things. Uh, And I want to talk about two of those with you, Patty. First of all, you have a chapter in the book uh, called Graham Three. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's so incredible when I read what you wrote for me to realize how significant that that 
that title is. Talk about that, please, for the audience. I begin the, the chapter called Graham Three, talking about Betty's wit and how brilliant she was. And she had this little creative ability to name everything the right name. So <laughs> yes, she did. My one of my favorites um, <laughs> when she used to come. Tom and I moved to Denver for a time, and uh, Tom and Betty shared the Morris Animal Foundation. Uh, Tom was president. Betty was a, a trustee emeritus who stayed hands on till the very end of her life. But that's an aside. She would stay with us. And as I was remodeling and making it our own home in Denver, I found this amazing fixture that I still have today. It's a, a glass bird of some kind um, that has a light above it. And so when Betty came to visit that time, I, I showed her the fixture, which I knew she'd be so delighted about. And I said, so Betty, what would you name it? She would say, and she would say, she is Electra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. just one of the examples of how she named things, certain things. And it just, it was her part of her brilliance. But suddenly, as we got to know Betty and be, became closer and closer over the years, um, she adored our children and she would come and be with them. She would go to our daughter's horse shows. She would be this young, younger grandma to them. Uh, both Tom's mother and my mother were still alive at the time. And so um, she knew that that they had two grand grandmothers. So suddenly at Christmas time, and I can't remember the exact date, but she would write cards to them and she would sign it, Graham three. And I thought, you know, that that's just so her. It's so sensitive. She would never assume that she was their grandmother. She was the third Graham, Graham three. And throughout our children's lives from the, the time they were young, um, they were aware of who Betty White was, first of all. And when she would come and visit, they sort of had the same reaction that I had initially. Whoa, she's <laughs> yeah. amazing. Yeah. She's just amazing. And the fact that she was hands-on with them from then and until last year when we lost her. And was um, hands-on. so special. She and, was totally hands-on. When you think that, that I can still picture <clears throat> Betty sitting on the floor in our son's bedroom when he was about six, putting Legos together or mm -hmm. picture Betty uh, who knew more about uh, aquatic issues and, and fish than most people in the world making believe that she didn't so that our son could show her his fish, fish tank as if he was the teacher. And then there were all the Sundays, Sunday after Sunday, when she would come to Blythe's horse shows now, here she was, right, Patty, at the height of her career. At the height of Golden Girls. And, and no she, one could be more visible as a celebrity than Betty White at that time. And she was standing at the fence. At the fence. Of mm -hmm. the ring, just glued to Blythe and, and, and horses. And then you might as well tell them about Joey. Well, I, I know we, we have some questions to get to, but... I hope that the audience here is enjoying our re remembrances of Betty as they're so, sort of coming to mind in the promotion of this book. Um, but in the chapter entitled Graham Three, um, Betty was very, very enthralled coming to the horse shows. And Blythe was, our daughter Blythe was just so excited to have Graham Three watching her take these fences and jump. And when you purchase the book, there are a bevy of family pictures uh, one which Betty gifted us is of her at about probably six years old. I'm thinking yeah, she's I sitting think on the pony and, uh, and then next to it is her standing beside our daughter and her jumper. And um, it, that is kind of the, the, the beginning and, and the middle of Betty's um, horse, I, horse, not her horse experience, but her, her love of horses and during this period of time, our daughter had uh, what you call a barn horse, which was more like her pet named Joey. And then she had a world-class jumper, uh, a Dutch warm blood called Dutch. Um, so Betty had come to a show and then um, Blythe noticed that her barn horse, Joey, who was jumping some fences as well, wasn't quite feeling well. And so uh, the next day we had the horse vet take a look at him and uh, it wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. And I, I don't want to mm, sort of take away from the chapter and how much emotion was there. 
but we we had to put Joey down. Uh, he had a big big um, growth. He had on, colic. Had colic, and and so it was a very emotional time. I still get emotional thinking about it today. And the first person that <clears throat> was right there for our daughter in every way was Graham Three. I I, I think Betty certainly took the responsibility of being the support, the love, the mentorship to Blythe, and then went on to engage Blythe in uh, one of her charities, which was Ride for the Disabled. And in a sense, what she did was she took Blythe's pain and turned it into Blythe's love, both for horses and special needs people who gained so much from riding them. I know we do have, have questions, and I do want to come back later on to, to sections of your book later in your book. But we have we have questions that we know well, be, are important. Before we go to the, to the first question, I would just like to, to um, sum up that chapter a little bit in saying that Tom and I as parents really could not offer the comfort to our daughter that Graham 3 could offer her. And again, it's a universal point. Our, our grandparents, our elders mean so much to us. And they step in at times when we as parents uh, can't really say what we need to say. Yeah. And that was true for Betty. Uh, that's really, I, I think maybe, Blythe was about 14, 15 then. And to have that Graham three step in who knew so much about horses. In addition, Betty had lost so many of her own pets at that point in time in her life. So she was able to give Blythe so much comfort um, as I say in the book, her arms were around Blythe throughout the experience. Her hands, her arms were loving Blythe in a very special way. And I, I think that all of us who are fortunate to have a grandparent or an elder like that, um, it's it's the one thing to recognize in life that our, our elders mean so much to us. And, and we don't want them to stand back. We want them to stand forward as Betty did at that wonderful time. Yeah, and we'll we'll come back as we go along here to other points in life when uh, Betty White was the source of strength for the Sullivans. She always, by the way, folks out there, called us her Sullivans. And we, I think if you said, what's our proudest moment in life and why this premier book can matter to you, it, our proudest moment was that we were her Sullivans. And our daughter came up with an acronym for Betty. She said that we were family. And I said, yeah, I know that. And I said, Blythe, what does that mean to you? And she said, family means for all moments in life, yours. What a phrase. What a phrase. For all moments in life, yours. And that's the relationship we had and, and, and still and will always treasure with uh, Betty White Ludden. I, I, um, I did mention the questions because we were yes. we were informed by Premier <laughs> that we got to get to these questions. We, and we'll start with Pat in Ohio, right? Yes, Pat in Ohio. Um, I've got books right here that I'm autographing to each and every one of you that has um, ordered a book through Premier. Um, I, and I there's more than a few of you. I've got my work <laughs> cut out for me. Yeah. But today we're doing a live signing. And Pat from Ohio asks... Is there a main theme you would want your readers to gain? And I would say one of the main themes of Betty's life that I would pass on to the readers is appreciation, appreciation for everything. And when I use that word, I hear her voice coming through me. Um, her mom, Tess, was all about you've got to appreciate, you've got to taste every minute you're in. And Betty constantly, constantly said that to us and to the world. You've got to be in the moment you're in and you've got to appreciate every minute. So Pat, I'm autographing this book to you and I'm going to put- With appreciation. With appreciation. That's Thank right. you so much. Thank you, Pat. You know, it, it, again, we're going to cover these immediate questions. We, well, Patty's signing, we, our next one, I think, is Liz. And uh, Liz is in Indiana, I think, right? Liz, I hope you're getting some nice snow for Christmas there, <laughs> there in Indiana. Um, and your question was, how did you meet Betty 
uh, first and become friends, which That's we kind of covered um, in the first 15 minutes of this time with you. Um, and I would say the friendship, like all friendships, it gets richer with time. And with Betty, we had so much blessed oh. time. Tom and I miss her every day yeah. as we come to this first anniversary of her loss. And we hope you'll enjoy reading Liz and understanding uh, that this book in its entirety really does answer your question. So uh, thank you for, for it, for sending it and P at Patty signing. And I'm and signing I, and, and to I, you. And I know we come, uh, we've got a guy in here, which that's good. Tim, uh, you're kind of up next, and and you you had something you wanted to ask. Okay. Yes, Tim, in New York, but uh, our our people in New York tell us it's pretty gorgeous <clears throat> there today. <laughs> so I hope you're not shoveling snow and doing something at four o'clock in the afternoon, other than uh, getting ready for dinner and enjoying a great evening. Thank you so much for purchasing and also for your question, which was. What is a, a favorite memory oh you boy. have with Betty? That's tough, huh, kid? It's actually very easy for me. Really? Um, okay. We had the great privilege of spending many, many Christmas, New Year's with oh, Betty in yes. her right. Carmel home. And the memory for me, Tom, you, you have yours. Yeah. But my favorite memory, my absolute favorite memory of Betty, and very much a part of the inspiration of this book, was visiting the um, Monterey Bay Aquarium. And the uh, staff had had put together a special day for Betty to show her everything that was going on. Betty was um, a major donor to the aquarium. And Betty was also most concerned about saving the sea otter population. She would see the sea otter from her uh, family room in Carmel and loved looking out over the Pacific and seeing the sea otters probably five, eight at a time. And then through time, the otters, sea otters were disappearing. So one of her main passions through the aquarium was to create a program to save the sea otter and their population from becoming extinct. And along the way, they were doing pretty well. And she and I, and Tom as well, went up to the, the rooftop of the aquarium where the, um, the pools for the sea otters exist. And we actually saw their biologists take a sea otter that had been lost at sea. It was a little baby who had lost its mother. And we saw this baby released to a surrogate mom. And I just, I could never put into words the look on Betty's face because she had, had supported and wanted so much uh, to see the sea otters rescued. And now it was happening. And she was just as, as bright as bright could be, a glow. Um, with the fact that this problem was being solved. So that would be my personal favorite. And as I sign this book to you, Tim, Tom, you, you talk about your well, favorite. Well, first, I, I want to continue that thought for a second, Patty. Um, I'm blessed to be one of the two trustees for Betty's estate. And, and the thing that touches me so is how defined she was about all of the charities and causes that she cared for. She used to always say that she was in show business to pay for her animal business. And, and I, I'd like to very much clear something up in people's heads about <laughs> Betty. Um, Betty was not, quote, an animal rights person. She was about animal health and welfare. Every single funding that has come from the Betty White Trust is about animal health and welfare. And that's a marvelous thing to have done. Uh, uh, it's so wonderful for us to be part of this today and for Patty to have written this beautiful book because it does paint the right picture of who Betty White truly is and was. Uh, I think Sarah's next. Yes, right? Sarah, good afternoon, your time in South Carolina. Uh, thank you so much for your question. And I'm wondering if you are pursuing a writing career yourself, because your question was, uh, what was your writing process like behind the book? <laughs> Can I make <laughs> a point about that? Yeah. <laughs> Patty, because of my background, Patty asked me to edit the book as we went along. Uh, that was a marriage test. <laughs> First of all. <laughs> we, we, that wasn't easy. But Sarah, this writing 
these remembrances of Betty, first of all, was not only an honor, but a delight in, in my lifetime to uh, record the beautiful Betty. Um, and I, I hope when you read the book, you will you will take that away. But in terms of the writing process, I I came up with an idea. I would take it at the essence of the mother of Pearl Stone and think about that as how it applied to Betty. So uh, I would write. I would get an inspiration. I'd write a little more. And then I would read a paragraph to Tom. Did he like it? And then I'd go back and I'd rewrite and I'd rewrite and I'd rewrite. And I would then read to Tom. And that was the process. I, I probably was the most self-edited <laughs> writer <laughs> yes, that were. I can imagine because I, I just wasn't <laughs> content with one single sentence or one single word until it felt right to me. So um, but as I say from the top, it was um, a gift of love from my heart. It, a lot of people have said, Patty, it's it's your love letter to Betty. It is. And it absolutely is. So um, if you think about writing as a love letter, uh, it, it comes really easily. Yeah. Um, but if you're writing a book, I'm wishing you good luck because it, it's a joy. It's good, a joy to do. Good luck, Sarah. <laughs> Who's next? On that? Oh. Darren? Is this Darren? Karen. Oh, Karen is next. Karen is next. Karen from Texas. From Texas. From Texas. I don't. And she didn't say did your, what part. Did your of Cowboys Texas. win last week? I, I can't. Remember. <laughs> the Cowboys are rolling. The Cowboys are rolling. It's a great time to be in Texas yeah. with the Karen, America's team. What does Karen want to know? Uh, Karen, you ask when writing this book, did it bring up any hard memories that you had forgotten about? Um, and actually, the hard memories are very present with both Tom and I because. It was uh, experiencing Betty going into twilight. COVID was the hardest, hardest last two, almost three years for everybody in the world. Um, for us, it hit home because we, we couldn't see Betty. We weren't allowed to see her, but for a few times. And within that frame, that that two, two and a half, three year frame when, when we lost her, um, to realize, recognize the dimming of her day and oh. the twilight she was in, it, it's like the onset was so quick. Um, I, I, it's a very personal chapter for me. Um, very hard to write because I still don't want to let Betty go. Karen. I still um, don't want to, to know that she's not here. Karen, Betty's uh, favorite song, she and Alan, was Our Love is Here to Stay by George Gershwin. And the last time we saw her, we weren't supposed to hug her, but we did anyway. We were told we could only see her for 15 minutes. And when we arrived, she was totally made up beautifully, all dressed, hair done. And at 100 years old, that was very unique. She, But she wanted this to be special. And at the end, we stood up and hugged her, and I sang the last part of the chorus. In time, the Rockies may tumble, Gibraltar may crumble. They're only made of clay, but... And I got to the last line, and we all sang together, our love is here to stay. And then she demanded that she have her walker, and she was going to walk us to the front door the way she had for what? For years. For years. years. Mm -hmm. And she did. And we stepped outside, and uh, for all those years, when Patty and I would leave at night, when we have dinner with her, I would wave now, Karen, blind people don't wave really well. <laughs> We're not good at it, but I gave my best. I gave my best wave. It's like the queen. The queen. Like the queen's wave. Yeah. <laughs> I gave my best wave, and Betty White, comedy icon, had the last line, the barumpum they call it in comedy. I waved, and she went, "Tom, drive carefully." <laughs> I just unbelievable. That's our Betty. That's our uh, Betty. And so twilight for everyone that's out there that has loved ones or people that they care for deeply, family, we all go through twilight. And uh, and and Betty had done it better than anyone else. Uh, she, while we're here, Patty has a chapter in the book about acceptance. And the biggest part of twilight was Betty's capacity to accept. You want to just talk about that for a second? You know, it's a question um, from, um, let's see, I'm trying to think who asked me that question. 
Carmen. Uh, Carmen, I think. Carmen, the, Carmen's the question. From Missouri um, asks, do you have a favorite chapter in the book? And, and Carmen, I, I would say to you that acceptance was definitely my favorite. And maybe it's because I, I'm getting to a certain age myself. But to reflect, You look good, though. You I do. do. Yeah. <laughs> the world, you know, I do tell Tom how beautiful I am. Every day. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. Um, but at any rate, to watch Betty, in, is particularly in the, the, um, <clears throat> the last 20 years, accept so many changes in her own life. From uh, she was not the it girl uh, during certain periods. She would she would say to Tom yeah. and I when she lost a role or when something wasn't renewed, I'm not current in choice. And you know she was very very matter of fact about it. She she didn't hesitate uh, to share that note notate that note with us that you know you, everybody gets uh, especially in show business you have your peak, and then life changes. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think Betty ever really peaked, to be honest with you. But she would recognize that Golden Girls was coming to an end. Um, you know, her her movies were where she was cast as an older person. She was very careful about accepting those. You know, if, if you're 80, you never tell your age. Otherwise, you'll never work again. Yeah. Um, and but so, at 90, she decided that it was kind of cool to be It was kind of cool. So she yeah. always was, she started to brag about it. <laughs> yeah. So maybe what we're really saying in acceptance <clears throat> is Betty understood adaptability. Adapting. She, uh -huh. she yeah. figured out how to, yeah. she said to me once she had learned to, uh, I love the phrase to adapt and adopt, adapt and adopt. But she yeah. fought it every step of the oh, way. Sure. And, you know, we, everybody close to Betty was concerned about her physical safety. You know, you really need to think about a walker. You really need to think about moving your bedroom downstairs. Absolutely not. Betty was committed yeah. to staying independent as long as she could. And more than that, <clears throat> she said to me, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to walk up and down these stairs in this house until I can't. And I said, well, yeah, but we want you to be safe. And she said, I have to stay strong. The second you don't, you don't. That's right. She was very, <clears throat> very in, in terms of this acceptance <clears throat> chapter, she was very aware of how to operate uh, within that context. And she did it better than anyone we've ever known. You got another question <clears throat> there? Kim? Well, just to finish off with Carmen, this is one of the two pearls in the book mm -hmm. for everyone whatever um, transitions people are going through, you know, you, you have a fall, you, you hurt your back, you've got to be tended to physically. Um, the beauty of the, this chapter on acceptance from many standpoints uh, of Betty's life, how she beautifully accepted her aging process, I guess you might say it, it was gorgeous. And she is an amazing example to everyone in life. Uh, never lose the, the the robust sense of humor. Never lose your being positive, and and so acceptance um, was the most meaningful chapter to me, Carmen. And uh, Tom, have you got another question there uh, for me? Let's see. Who else should we uh, be talking to? I think I think Laura might be the next one, huh? Can you see? Is it? I think it's Laura. Oh, it's Laura. Laura, we're sorry. From, I know. L U R A, Laura. From Florida, right? Um, good afternoon, your time. Um, your question was what? What was your favorite thing to do with Betty? <laughs> Tom, is there any question? What our favorite thing was? <laughs> I apologize. I'm glad this is not uh, uh, network television. I would say, have a drink and good conversation. <laughs> I like red breast Irish whiskey and Betty liked vodka on the rocks and Patty drank scotch. And we would sit in her beautiful Carmel home <clears throat> at five o'clock. And then magical things would happen. We talked about everything, everything. In fact, oh boy, Betty White took a blind man inside things like the colors of the ocean what they really were like, the blues and greens. She talked about how the sun would <clears throat> drop like a knife into the sea. She'd discuss how high, oh boy, how high the waves were on the cliffs. Now, while she was doing that, I would talk to Patty and Betty about how there are 15 different kinds of waves that you could hear on Betty's beach 
all the way from the ones that come in at high tide where the sand would come together like a like Muhammad Ali was fighting Joe Frazier, a dull thud, to the ones at low tide that would ebb and flow, and you could hear them over the sun-drenched sandbars. You know, it, uh, we used to walk on, on the beach when she would collect sea glass. And, and, and there are 11 different types of sand on Betty's Beach. I don't know how many kinds of birds there are that you could hear. And the smells, the sensual, sensual smells were unbelievable. So while Betty was teaching me about blues and greens, I, I was maybe blessed to be teaching her. And, and, and all of that, while we shared a, a cocktail and a level of love and commitment, uh, that was yeah yeah so, so remarkable so i guess that there's not one thing there's many things yeah and and uh i i hope again in uh betty white's pearls of wisdom that i've shared you know some of the very personal stories of a lot of the joy we had with her uh, um, shall we go on to greg and and yeah, from uh, north carolina greg from my, one of my favorite places i don't know what part of north carolina greg but there are a lot of golf courses for me to play down there. <laughs> Greg in North Carolina. I remember I read this. What he, what did he ask? What made you and Betty laugh most at? <laughs> oh goodness! And, and Greg, I, I will say to you here, I cannot repeat. <laughs> <laughs> it is not for prime time. No. What made us laugh the most? Tell the shepherd story. I, though. That's Tell, what I was going to yeah, do. Yeah. But um, when, when uh, in one of the chapters called "Strength and Survival," uh, we had a. I was talking about the last big fire we had here in Los Angeles, and uh, Betty chose to come down and be with us. Um, she had to be evacuated from her home, and I just can't imagine the fear and anxiety, knowing at ninety seven, ninety eight that you could lose everything in a day's time because the fires out here sweep from mountain to mountain, from, from canyon to canyon, there's no controlling. Um, so it was a couple of pretty scary days. And, and as I say in the book, I had never seen a frightened Betty before that weekend. Um, that said, when the fires were out, her home had survived, she was safe. And she was uh, able to go back to her home. There was a sense of relief that was just palpable. And so that night I made a dinner of shepherd's pie, <laughs> which is, you know, comfort food to the max. And uh, the ground beef, the gravy, and then mashed potatoes on top. And Betty was not a foodie. Anybody that knew her, it, food was just secondary. It was, the only reason for food was to stay alive, and she didn't care about it at all. But I was really trying to give her some some su sustenance that felt good in her stomach after so much stress. So we're sitting here uh, at the <laughs> at the dining room table where she often came for Thanksgivings and Christmases. Right in this room. Right in this room, and we're serving up the the shepherd's pie. And I, I sat it down. And I said, you know, Betty, I, I know food isn't isn't your thing, but I, I hope you will enjoy the shepherd's pie. So she's stir, stirring her fork under the 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 bowl kind of thing. And she's kind of flipping it over, looking underneath what's in this. And she's taking a bite and, and she removes the spoon. And she said, you know, I have just never been much of a pie person. But I love those shepherds. <laughs> I love those shepherds. You know, she loved men way more yeah. than she loved women. But the but double, the double entendre of, of how I she loved love those shepherds. Ever, ever, Betty never, ever, ever missed a line. Never. I, I mean, the, or a that, moment, or a moment, because that, that was part of her. It was part of what separated her from the rest of us. The quickness of her mind, and that goes all the way back to her early television, the Jack Parr show, and then all the tonight shows with Johnny Carson, when she would do Tarzan and Jane skits uh, or, you know, she just, it, uh, I, I one time got talking to Carl Reiner about Betty and he said that <clears throat> she was the quickest person that he'd ever known. And he's known all the great ones, yeah. uh, God rest his soul. But she, she was, she was so remarkable in that sense. And she'd constantly do it. The double entendre was everything. That made her, because in effect, she was also someone that would laugh at her own joke. She loved, she'd, she'd tell the story or 
use the entendre and then start laughing before she finished her own. And I guess for all of you who can see, Patty, right? It was her glistening eyes and those yeah, dimples. And huh? her dimples. But she also had a straight face because she loved getting everybody else to laugh. And she would just hold, much like Johnny Carson, I, I think they had that in common. Yeah. She would hold the audience and then she would allow herself to laugh. It was just a very endearing <laughs> and, part and, of Betty. And, and Greg, we laughed a lot. Who else have we got to talk um, to? We have uh, Harold in Washington. Okay. I, I don't know if you're <clears throat> in Washington State or Washington, D.C., but Thank you so much for your question uh, today, which is, um, do you think you will continue writing books? Thank you for that question. That's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting next to the author of 14 books over time. Betty wrote quite a few herself. But honestly, Harold, I, I think this is my one and only. Um, I, I'm just charged and filled and, and passionate about my love for Betty and how much she meant to my life. And, and my my want is to honor her and to keep her legacy alive. And and I think for all writers, it, it has to take that kind of passion yeah. to put something on paper. Um, but never say never. Who you know, knows? <laughs> Harold, you've raised though, a really good point. I, I have been blessed to write 15 books. And uh, some of them are written as just work that you do. I've only had two experiences uh, where the writing was, it took on a different shape. I, I wrote a book on childhood cancers <laughs> because of a particular story. And I wrote a book called Adventures in Darkness, uh, actually three books. And the book with Betty, Betty and I wrote a book called The Leading Lady that I wish had been a premier book. By the way, you're all lucky to get these premier books. The, the first, first 2,500 people writing, Patty's autographs are in there. And you'd say that your book was, you, we think that Betty had a lot to do with your writing. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely felt the inspiration coming through from another another source um, that inspired some, some sentences I'm very proud of and some thoughts I'm very proud of. So Betty was the inspiration, uh, absolutely. Um, and and if if I write another book, I it couldn't mean could mean the end of our marriage. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, it would not be as special as this one. No. So what's the point? I, yeah. I, I, I've written what I what I wanted to write. It's, and, it's, but it's, thank you for the question. And, I appreciate. And that. Harold, to answer the question fully from both of us, I will tell you honestly, when you start to read this, <clears throat> I couldn't. I as, as someone who lived it too, I couldn't have written it. This was, this was the magic relationship between two women. I, I have had the privilege of writing the forward to the book. And the first line in the book uh, forward was, I have been blessed to be in love with two women who changed my life. And it, it, I really felt that way about them both. And, uh, so that's part of why both of us miss Betty. So you got another question somewhere in there? Uh, yes. Um, Linda from Arkansas. Uh, Linda, thank you so much for your question. Thank you. I hope you, that you're on uh, the this live stream today. I, it, it's kind of hard for Tom and I not to see anybody out there. Not me, see boy. Your face. I have no <laughs> that's trouble. True. That's true. How could I have said that? <laughs> I don't know. Take that back. Very insensitive. <laughs> but your question, if you and Betty had the whole day free, what would a perfect day oh, look like? Linda, great question. What would it look like? Kid? So, well, I, I know that our, our trips to Carmel, the one we would pick her up in the morning and drive her to her favorite place was the start of a perfect day for Bets. Of course, it was a long six hour drive. So, you know, the whole day wasn't the perfect day. But for me and Tom, you would have your memories. I would say a perfect day was uh, waking up and having coffee together. Uh, going over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, seeing the latest exhibit and having uh, their wonderful docents give me a treat because they were actually treating Betty because she was the donor, but I got to follow along and share that with her. Uh, and then coming back to her house, we'd probably have a game of Scrabble. Well, we might have we might have stopped on and the way for a golf. We might have. Well, I was just going to say we'd watch golf after a game of Scrabble. Yeah. And then we'd play some more Scrabble <laughs> and then we'd have dinner. And then we'd have some more Scrabble. <laughs> they, they, these two, I wish all of you in this audience could have been part of watching these two play Scrabble. Now, you're going to read. It was fierce. It was fierce oh, competition. I, I, I'd get scared. I'd, yeah. I'd go in the other I room. I would say to Betty, you always get the Z. 
and the Q and the X in the same little shelf here. What was it's your favorite fair. word? <laughs> favorite word was Aya. I'm getting ready to tell you about that. Okay. But, um, she would get all the all the big counters, and I would get so mad and so crazy because you know it's all luck, it's all the draw. And I would say you you'd get those. You are have a whole advantage over me. And she would just um, uh, sort of quietly say to me very firmly, <laughs> "It's not the letters you get, my dear. It's what you do with them." <laughs> so she would just cut me off at the neck. <laughs> I, I, I since this is since this is. It's just a fun story. We we used to love to go to uh, Clint Eastwood's uh, the Mission Ranch. Mission Ranch. Restaurant, yeah. It's owned by Clint Eastwood in in right in there in Carmel. Yeah. And obviously, we would sit and have a couple of drinks with dinner, and and our dinner, and then come home. And so on this particular night, we had a couple of drinks. And I remember as we came to the car, Patty said to me, "This is great. I'll get home now. We'll play Scrabble." And I'll kick her butt. I'm going to get her. I'm, I'm going to turn her. disadvantage into advantage. And I am winning. <laughs> yeah, well, let me just tell you something. The next morning, Patty was still crying and Betty was still winning. <laughs> she creamed me <laughs> worse than ever. And for yeah. any of you in the uh, listening audience who uh, went up online to see the Betty White auction, you will have seen um, That's right. the Scrabble board that we played on. Uh, and next to it, you would see our scores. <laughs> Betty's was 350 and I was back at 240 on my best day. <laughs> Patty, so I hope that answers the question yeah, I hope it of, does. Of, of the perfect day. Uh, we have a question from Stacy in Maryland. And oh, she, I saw this question. This is she good. wanted to know uh, if I had to choose one film or show to watch that Betty was in, yeah. which would it be and why? And, and I would just answer by saying, Tom and I are like the rest of the world. We watch Golden Girls every, every night of the week that we're watching TV. She just had such, that, that was just the most amazing show that, that lives on because it was so beautifully written. But my favorite film uh, with Betty in it was The Proposal. It uh, kept Betty was cast as an older woman and granny uh, or grandma Annie was her character. And I think so many of the the um, parts of Betty, uh, the human being that we knew and loved uh, was was portrayed in that character. So that would be uh, Stacy, my favorite. And Tom, I, I'm going to autograph to Stacy. We have a couple more questions. So while I do this. Yeah, um, the, the Stacy, the, the interesting thing, too, is is. Um, I like the things that Betty had to do that forced her to play something that she, in a sense she wasn't. And there are great stories about that. Um, when she played uh, 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 the chef on Mary Tyler Moore, uh, the, they had actually, uh, the, the Grant Tinker, Mary's husband, had said, well, let's go out and try to find a Betty White type because he knew Betty so well as a person. And they went on and they auditioned a whole bunch of different people, Betty White type. And eventually they finally came back and said, listen, what the hell are we doing? Let's just get Betty White. <laughs> but when she played that role, she really uh, had to become a character that it, it was partially her. The one, though, that is the most astounding is Rose Nyland, because Betty was everything Rose uh, was not. I mean, but Betty, she, I think Rose was her favorite character. Oh, though, that said, it was her very, very favorite. Every one of us thought she that she was from Minnesota, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> that she was sort of that naive, wondrous person, you know. And obviously, Betty was quick and bright and, and sophisticated and funny and all the things that Rose wasn't. And yet, Betty would say to us, "There is nothing wrong with being a Pollyanna. There is nothing wrong with thinking the best, the most beautiful thoughts you you have." to being not, you know, she was not innocent. Of course, oh, Betty was, was, was well-schooled in life, wise. worldly, worldly wise, wise. Yeah. but there was a part of her too that appreciated the Pollyanna, that person who brought the positive to the picture, positive to life. That was a character. She lived through Rose uh, on, on television, but it's also a part of her character that she truly believed in. Um, so I, I think that, um, are you caught up with your autographs here? We've got, we've got, I believe, just one more question, unless something else has come in. We, we've got three more questions, okay. actually. Uh, but this is Caroline from Michigan. And Caroline, I was born in Detroit, so we have something in common there. I, I don't know if you grew up in Michigan, but 
I, I remember it as such a beautiful place. And I would also add that um, three of Tom's guide dogs uh, were, were trained at uh, Guide Dogs for the Blind Leader in Rochester. Dog. Yep. Leader Dog Leader. for the Blind in Rochester. And oh my gosh, they were, they were beauties, all three of them. Uh, amazing, gorgeous. Um, but your question, what inspired you to come out with this book now? Um, that's an easy one to answer, Caroline, because Tom and I, for the last five years, have been aware of, you know, Betty's uh, dim the dimming of her day. And, uh, you know, when we were to ask her that question, is there anything you would like us to do? Um, and she would say, do, you know, you, you kids do what you want to do. Um, I, I began thinking about Betty's friends. You know, most of her friends from the various shows had passed away already. And there, no, was, there was no one left to speak for her, to tell her story. And so I think what part of the inspiration of actually um, trying to find a publisher for my book was that I, I want to tell her story in more personal ways, how she affected me and Tom and our children, who she called her family. And so really, this was about honoring her. And thank you, Jonathan Merck at uh, a Forefront. Thank you, Simon and Schuster. Thank you for all the support team for making this happen in time to celebrate her first anniversary. And now, thank you, Premier, for personalizing this work in a way that allows 2,500 or so or more people to share with us on a more intimate basis. We feel like when you have a premier book, uh, you've joined a premier club uh, and the club is, is for specialness, you know? Uh, and I, I so appreciate that the boxed edition, uh, the commemorative edition is so beautifully done. And I, I just can't thank everyone enough for making a dream of mine come true. And they did. And they did. You've got, couple we have more. one last question and I know we're coming to the end of our time with everyone. And so before we, we do close off, I, I think both Tom and I want to express, oh, um, I forgot, to turn the phone off. forgot to turn off our house phone. Sorry about that. But I, I just can't express enough how special this day is this moment being with all of you who love Betty White as we did and have these wonderful questions. And the last one, uh, Tony from California, if Betty was here today, what's something you think she would want us to know? And I would say, oh, great uh, question. Betty would want us to, again, appreciate the moment we're in and to pursue your interest, to, to pursue um, the things that are important to you and not waste a minute of this life, not waste one minute of this life. Really, uh, that is the, the biggest pearl. And, and I have said to friends, I needed to be this age to write this book. So I really got who she was. And Tony, I in California here, you're on our time. Um, it's something B Betty lived and breathed most of her life. So I would say she would want you to know that about her. And she would want you to take that pearl and make it your own. There's a wonderful story, Tony about uh, Betty well, one morning when her executive assistant, a wonderful woman, Kirsten, had come to the house. Betty was 98 when this happened and she was upstairs. Kirsten was downstairs and Betty was putting her makeup on. And Kirsten heard Betty talking to herself and she said, I have to make the most of this day. I have to do the right thing. She had established at some point in her life a mantra about that. And, and I, I tell you, nobody lived life, right, Patty, with the passion? No one lived life. That, that uh, Betty White uh, established early in her life. And I, brought to everything through the last days, honestly. She appreciated every moment of the life she was given. And she shared that appreciation. She shared her passion by doing so much work for not only uh, animals, great and small, who could not speak for themselves, but for this planet. She really was interested and, and passionate to have mankind understand what our footprints are doing. So uh, conservation for this beautiful planet and everything in it, God-given. So all of you out there, please uh, enjoy your premier books. Uh, we're so delighted that Premier gave us the opportunity. Maybe uh, if you've got a bunch of friends that want a bunch of these wonderful Premier books, mm -hmm. we'll come back and have another conversation with you. But for today, 
from Tom and Patty Sullivan, and far more importantly, from the great and loving and wondrous Betty White Ludden. We want to thank you for this time. We hope we get to see you again. Enjoy your reading. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.